we are speaking about once more synchrotron relation beams. So the speaker is Duncan Butler from PANSA. And this webinar will be chaired by Massimo Pinto from NAR. Massimo is a vice chair of CSRI section one about dosimetry, and he is a member of the CSRI communication working group. So please Massimo, floor is yours. Thank you, Vincent, and uh, good morning, uh, afternoon, and night to everybody. Thanks for attending this webinar, which is, uh, is, uh, is uh, going to start in a moment. I'm, I'm just going to uh, mention that Duncan Butler is uh, the head of the uh, primary standards dosimetry lab in Australia. Answer. He has a long experience in, uh, in measurement of the quantity absorbable to water. I, I... So thank you. Uh, so welcome everyone to this CCRI webinar on uh, synchrotron radiotherapy dosimetry and detector response. Um, thank you for the invitation to present. Um, and I'm coming from the uh, from Melbourne, Australia. It's 10 p.m. at night. I'm on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And the talk will be in three parts. Uh, I will introduce uh, synchrotrons and how they produce radiation and talk about radiotherapy. Uh, radiotherapy is a very strange use for a synchrotron beam. There's only a couple of applications of that in the world. Synchrotrons are used for many things and radiotherapy is not normally one of them. Uh, and then I'll talk about reference dosimetry for those radiotherapy beams. And in particular, I'll be talking about the things in the green box, which are the conventional uh, detectors we use for conventional radiotherapy and how they respond differently in synchrotron beams. And then <clears throat> I'll reverse the sense of the presentation a bit and ask what can those unique synchrotron beams tell us about uh, those radiotherapy detectors. Uh, please forgive my voice if it's a bit scratchy. I have COVID, uh, not badly, but uh, that's my excuse for sounding <clears throat> raspy. Uh, so one slide about me, I've worked at Arpanza for more than 20 years, where I'm now the director of the Primary Standards Dosimetry Laboratory in Melbourne. I did do one year seconded to the ANSTO Australian Synchrotron, which is also in Melbourne, uh, which is where a lot of this work came from. But I've also been a visitor to several synchrotrons. And uh, I was the chair of the APMP TCRI for three years until recently. I do want to say um, all of this work is not so much my own. Maybe towards the end, some of it is my work, but I started off copying other people and I do want to shout out a few names, uh, in particular Elke Braukrish and Pauline Fournier. I think the first presentations I saw on reference dosimetry for synchrotrons, the team at IMBL, more on them later. Uh, Jessica Lai, who I worked with, it was her idea to put the free air chamber and the calorimeter on a synchrotron beam. And on the right, we see Peter Hardy, Tracy Bailey, and Gannison Ramanathan doing that with a graphite calorimeter. And at the same time, we learned Simon Duane below from NPL in the UK was doing the same thing at the in France. Uh, Jeff Crosby took me to my first uh, synchrotron experiment in Japan at Spring 8. And on the left is Andrew Stevenson, who knows everything about synchrotrons and about dosimetry. So he's a little bit of a unicorn in that, that regard. But all these people sort of guided what I did. And in most cases, I was just doing what they suggested. So how do synchrotrons produce radiation? Uh, to understand that, we just need to know uh, a simple fact of physics that any charged particle, when it's accelerated, it radiates electromagnetic energy. Uh, and synchrotrons work, they use very fast charged particles. And here I'm imagining an electron. Most synchrotrons use electrons. That doesn't have to be an electron. Uh, if that's clever traveling close to the speed of light and it changes direction, uh, it will radiate a photon. And if it's going close to the speed of light, it's forward directed. Uh, and in fact, at 3 GeV, which is what the Australian synchrotron operates at, that um, the electrons traveling at uh, how many nines is that? It's very close to the speed of light and the photons come off tangentially. So synchrotrons work by effectively deflecting electrons so that they go in a ring. So they go from magnet to magnet being deflected, and whenever they're deflected, they radiate photons tangentially. And those photons have some special properties, and they're used for experiments in beam lines. Uh, I'll just note here, one, one thing you can do is um, if you use more than one magnet, you can make the electrons wiggle 
back and forth. And if you get the spacing right, they can add up and then you get many more photons coming out and they can be partially coherent like a laser. And that's what radiotherapy beamlines usually use. This device is called a wiggler. This is from Wikipedia. It shows what a synchrotron looks like. It has a linear accelerator. So in this case, the electrons are the bl light blue. They accelerate up, they go into a booster ring. They get up to the, uh, the energy they're going to be at, say 3 GeV, and they go into the storage ring where they're maintained and their energy is topped up and they're replaced if they fall out. So this is called a storage ring. And wherever the beam bends, there's a tangential photon beam coming out. And so you have all these experimental hutches where samples are put in the beam, detectors look at the sample, and uh, that's essentially a synchrotron. They can be very different sizes. Uh, <clears throat> the ones used for radiotherapy are usually fairly large. So a couple of things about synchrotron radiation from that. Um, first of all, synchrotron radiation is photons. It, the energy range is huge. It can go from infrared optical to x-rays. Uh, the beams are very fixed. It's very hard to scan these photon beams around. You can deflect them slightly with mirrors, but it's problematic. Uh, dose fates vary, but they can, can be very high. Um, you can use a monochromator, a crystal monochromator, to select a single energy. That's really valuable. A lot of them do that for other experiments, not for radiotherapy. Uh, there's some degree of coherence. They're very bright. The source size is very small. And also they're polarized, which is slightly different to what we're used to in conventional uh, radiotherapy. And it does affect dosimetry a little bit. Cool. So uh, this is the one I spent the most time at, the Australian Synchrotron in Melbourne. Uh, but I did want to call out also uh, the ESRF in France, in Grenoble, the top, and Spring Aid in Japan. These are big synchrotrons that have had or have large radiotherapy uh, beam lines as part of them. They do lots of other things as well, of course. Uh, Spring Aid in particular is 8 GeV. This is a really big uh, synchrotron. Uh, back in Australia, this is the Australian synchrotron and the medical and the imaging and medical beam line is a long uh, beam line. It's about 130 meters long. Uh, this white line is the electrons in orbit. Uh, the reason for that is they do imaging in the far hutch and the long beam line gives them uh, really beautiful images. I will talk a little bit about that later, but the radiotherapy experiments are up close to the source where the intensity is much higher. This is a photograph inside where the electrons travel. So this is inside the storage ring. So it's all evacuated where the electrons go, but inside the yellow boxes are bending magnets. And this device here, the silver thing, is a um, cryostat containing the superconducting multipole wiggler that goes up to 4.2 Tesla makes the electrons wiggle and produces an extremely intense beam of X-rays or synchrotron radiation. Uh, the spectrum from that depends on the magnetic field and the spacing and a few things, but in general, it looks something like the red line shown here. And it's pretty similar to a conventional KV spectrum. Uh, depends how much filtration you put on, but generally you want to cut out the low energy photons, which are not good for radiotherapy. Shown in blue is a conventional 180 kVp spectrum. And you can see they're pretty qualitatively similar. Uh, two differences. One, there's no, uh, these are the tungsten characteristic X-rays, which we don't have in the synchrotron. And also there's no hard cutoff at the maximum here because in the synchrotron, there is actually a 3 GeV electron beam and you could get photons up to 3 GeV theoretically, just that they're exponentially unlikely. But they do use, with this spectrum, they can filter it and use, say, 300 kV for imaging. So th the talk is about dosimetry, but I do want to motivate uh, why, why that's important. And it's because these beams can be used for radiotherapy and motivating that. Why, why, can, why would you want to use a synchrotron for radiotherapy? And there's two reasons. The first one is um, recently there's some evidence that 
radiation delivered at very high dose rates uh, actually has a better therapeutic effect. That is, for the same doses, normal tissue can handle it a bit better if the dose rate is really high. Uh, this is called the flash effect, and it seems to be real. There's quite a few experiments um, indicating that. And the limit seems to be somewhere around 40 gray per second. To put that in perspective, ESRF is about 14 kilogray per second, so 14,000 gray per second. And Australia is about 6,000 gray per second. So well into that uh, flash region. The other reason, though, is that because of the small source size, you can collimate these beams and they will hold their shape as they propagate. Also because they're KV, they don't spread as much because the electron range is very small. So you can create microbeams, and this shows a um, plot of microbeams where they're about 50 microns wide. And some radiotherapy experiments on mice and cells indicate um, some quite good results with these beams where normal tissue can handle it, even though the dose in the beams is is quite large, whereas cancerous tissue uh, doesn't handle, uh, can't handle these beams, and you get quite a good result. Uh, just to give that some perspective, this, this is a QA film. So this is a slice of film with the beam in this direction, um, just, just doing uh, QA. Uh, we're doing image guidance for a, a lung crossfire for a paper by Verdiana Trapetti, which you can look up. Um, but it's a crossfire, so two beams, 30 degrees apart, five millimeters wide with 12 microbeams. Uh, so these are the sort of experiments that have been done at the moment. And more recently at, in the ESRF, they have treated a uh, pet canine, a French bulldog appropriately, uh, for brain cancer using microbeams. But again, this talk is about dosimetry. I'm just leaving that there for uh, motivation. So why dosimetry? What is it and uh, why is it important? Um, so if you have any radiation beam, it, particularly in a synchrotron, it's characterized by uh, a whole bunch of things like the number of photons per second, energy spectrum, divergence, spectral brightness, profile, and coherence. They're all properties of the beam. And the synchrotron know the engineers, the physicists, they know what this is. They've designed the synchrotron and it's been calculated and commissioned. Uh, and this tells you everything about the radiation. However, in an experiment, you put a sample in the beam. You get radiation scattered off and transmitted radiation. And in the, the beam, you will do some experiment with that to tell you about the properties of the sample, like what it's made of or how fast a chemical reaction is happening. Or you might be just using the transmitted radiation to image the sample. Uh, but the sample, in a sense, doesn't really care about the photons per second and things like that. It cares about the energy deposited inside the sample, particularly if this is a radiotherapy experiment and this is some living cell or creature. Uh, so measuring the energy deposited is dosimetry. And it's not always um, well understood at synchrotrons because mostly the samples, it doesn't matter what, what dose they get. And I'm not going to go through these equations, but uh, this is from Andrew Stevenson. And the engineers and physicists will talk about the beam line in terms of the spectral brightness, which is this quantity. Uh, and if you want the dose, you can calculate that from... Ooh, from an expression, and I'll leave that if you can freeze the video and uh, work back from that. But that's the relationship between dose and spectral brightness. So the other weird thing about, well, the, the weirdest thing about synchrotron radiation is that it's, it's a bit of a strange shape for radiotherapy. Typically, it's um, here we're at 30 meters from the source, and we've got a sort of Gaussian profile about 40 millimeters wide and a few millimeters high. So that's not particularly good for radiotherapy of any uh, tumor of any size. <clears throat> so the solution is to select a uniform part of that beam and um, collimate the beam. So just use a mask and you can end up with something maybe 20 millimeters across and two millimeters high. That's pretty uniform. Again, that's not that useful, but if you have a sample 
and then move it at a constant velocity through that, uh, you can see that every point on that sample will have received the same dose. So this is a dynamic way of delivering dose, and it's very common uh, for radiotherapy with synchrotrons in order to get a bigger dose, more uniform field, sorry. Uh, often you use a mask. So for example, here's a square mask. So the beam comes on and the whole thing is translated through the beam. And that will deliver, say, a 20 by 20 millimeter field to the sample. And this is the sort of field we want to do dosimetry in reference dosimetry. Uh, yeah, this slide shows, actually, it was a bit of a personal tragedy for me um, because I was investigating something to do with dosimetry. And I thought I'd found a really interesting effect. And in fact, what was happening is my aperture, so the um, the mask, was actually melting in the beam. So at 6,000 gray per second, you start to heat things up. And you, I was really disappointed. The, um, the Nobel Prize will have to wait because it wasn't a new effect. It was actually the aperture becoming liquid and dripping onto the floor. So when I found that, I was uh, devastated. So normally they use uh, tungsten. This one's tungsten, and that will not melt. But this was a cerebend low melting point alloy, and it did melt. And it's not unusual to have the fire brigade come out if you forget to um, turn on the water cooling to some of the components, as I also found out. So uh, dynamic delivery, so the dose uh, everywhere in the field is given by the dose rate times the height of the beam, the static beam, the purple bit, H, divided by the velocity. Um, it's pretty easy to work out this formula. It does make it a bit confusing when you're in there. You need to, the faster you scan, the, the lower the dose. It's a little bit of an inverse uh, calculation. But this, this is the formula we use uh, for doing dosimetry, um, relating the dose rate to the dose in the sample. So some considerations for dosimetry. Uh, <clears throat> We've already seen the spectrum. It's similar to KV X-rays, around 100 KV average. Uh, the dose rate is very high, typically between 0.1 and 20,000 gray per second. Uh, so that means you get radiation damage. In fact, any detector with too much plastic in it uh, can have can suffer damage. Some iron chambers only last a year. Also, you can heat the chamber up. So if you're measuring an ionization chamber repeatedly, it will get hotter and the signal will go down. And the big problem is recombination losses because these are very high, high dose rate. The beam is pulsed. Uh, the electrons are pulsed and so the photons are pulsed as well. However, it's extremely fast and faster than my ions migrate inside ion chambers or inside the air. So the beam can be considered continuous. And as I mentioned before, it's polarized. Okay, so I'll talk about a couple of different types of ion chambers, free air chambers and um, this pinpoint chamber. These are photographs of uh, these detectors that would be familiar to people doing conventional radiotherapy, film and alanine and then others. So this is a beam's eye view of a free air chamber. So the radiation would basically hit us in the face in this case. Uh, these are good in the sense that they do not touch the radiation. So they're very, they're unlikely to be damaged. They do slowly get damaged from scattered radiation to some of the insulators in the cables and things, but generally they're very robust. Uh, this, this shows, the picture shows two of them. In this picture, the beam comes out of a beryllium window here, goes through this chamber, and you can see it's left a red mark on this bit of burn paper through the second free air chamber, left a red mark on the burn paper and onto the experiment over here. So they're excellent uh, for beam monitoring in particular. That's what they're being used for here. They work by, um, you have a, a collecting plate, a plate at 6,000 volts. So there's a huge electric field between the two plates. When the next ray goes through, it ionizes the air and you get an electrical signal. Uh, which you read with an electrometer. 
they're they can be used as a primary standard, but you need to know the beam area very accurately. Uh, they're mostly used for beam monitoring. They're excellent for that. Uh, they're also used, um, well, they suffer from recombination at high dose rates. They can be corrected for that uh, up to quite a high loss, I believe. Uh, but eventually, at 6,000 gray per second, they will uh, have too much rec recombination. Uh, but they're great for monochromatic beams. And I think Massimo and uh, the Chinese group have, have used these for um, monochromatic beams uh, with really good results. They do have an electron loss correction. If you're using them as a primary standard, you want every secondary electron created in the air gap. Uh, you don't want them to reach the plates. And so you have to calculate what the loss is. And it turns out that depends on the polarization. Um, and it's different for photoelectric and Compton. So it's quite a complicated calculation. And most codes don't, they just assume random polarization. So to calculate that accurately can be problematic. But I will leave a couple of references here. One to um, a paper by Narayama, and, which talks about the polarization as well, and where um, Jeff Crosby and Jess Lai used those, used the primary standard on um, Australia's beamline. Thimble chamber, if you're not familiar with what's inside them, these are um, really standard for radiotherapy. This is the active element. It's about two and a half centimetres long. And inside that you have air, the red bit, and a collecting electrode at say 400 volts, the outer electrodes at zero, and you measure the charge produced in that due to ionization. Uh, this pharma type is actually too large for the synchrotron. Our biggest beam is really 20 millimeters by 20 millimeters. So just physically it's too large. It will also suffer from recombination with that much air normally. So the really common approach is to use the pinpoint chamber, which is like a farmer chamber, but much smaller. Um, it's only about five millimeters long. This shows one being irradiated. Uh, there's a film behind it just for alignment purposes. And you can see it's been hit by radiation in the air there. So right now I'm up to the reference dosimetry bit. So this is um, this is what has become the the most standard way to measure these beams. Uh, it's with a pinpoint chamber or a semiflex, but generally a pinpoint in water or in solid water at two centimeters depth with a twenty millimeter by twenty millimeter square field. And it turns out that is actually uh, quite similar to doing a conventional beam reference dosimetry. The, for traceability, the simplest way is to uh, buy one of these chambers and get it calibrated at PTB in Germany because they have an absorbed dose to water standard. Uh, so that's super convenient because these chambers will eventually die because they have a plastic coating and they will crack. Uh, and you can just buy one, get it calibrated. Generally, um, We've used four beams from 100 kV to 280 kV. And in this plot, you can see that the there is a bit of energy response, but it's within about 1% over the whole synchrotron range. So you can really use this chamber without, a, without much of a correction factor. That's the model 31014 pinpoint chamber. <clears throat> Unfortunately, it's no longer available. And the replacement 31022 uh, has a has more stronger energy response. And in the bottom graph, I've plotted the ratio between those two chambers in air for conventional beams. And there is sort of a 10% energy response for the 31022. So you can still use it, but you have to be careful to correct the energy response. Uh, also the recombination for this chamber is, is quite a bit larger. Quick word on, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but um, it turns out the, the standard TLS398 two voltage method appears to work for calculating recombination. Uh, as I said, the beams pulse, but it's really fast. Uh, the other difference is when you, when you scan through uh, the beam, the chambers in the beam, it's not fully irradiated, even though it's measuring a 20 by 20 
square field, only a small part of the chamber is irradiated at any one time. So the recombination could be different, but experiments show that it uh, it's well modeled by these equations. And in particular, I'll call out um, uh, Pauline's work at the ESRF, where they reduced the storage ring, the electron storage ring current from uh, all the way down to, there's, theirs is at 200 milliamps. I think they went down to 20 milliamps. So really reduced the um, absorbed dose to water rate and looked at the uh, recombination loss as a function of dose rate, essentially. And varied from, it's only 5% at 15,000 gray per second, which is pretty amazing for a uh, an ionization chamber. <clears throat> that was for the model 31014. Uh, yes, more about sex. So with using an ion chamber like this, there's a couple of questions like, um, well, the field size is only 20 millimeters across, but it was calibrated in a 10 centimeter field. Um, so we have done a lot of work to check that the doses are correct. Uh, one of them, one of the techniques I've used was uh, alanine, which we got from NPL in the UK. It's these white pellets, put them in virtual water, solid water, and irradiated them. <clears throat> the you do because it's kilovoltage radiation, you do have to correct for the mm. energy response, but that is understood. And when you do that, you get quite good agreement with the ion chambers. Radiochromic film, we personally, I failed to use that for dosimetry. Uh, I know other people have had some success, um, but generally it's, it's quite non-linear, has an energy dependence. You can't use the normal EBT3. You have to use a high dose film and that's less uniform. Uh, so I found it very hard to use for absolute dosimetry, but it's it's really good for getting profiles of microbeams, beam profiles, and um, relative dosimetry. And this plot shows something that took me a while to get my head around, but the because the beam is polarized, it propagates through water a bit differently uh, than if it wasn't polarized, the in the field there's no there's no difference, but the scattered radiation does show a slight uh, difference horizontal versus vertical, which you can see in this this plot here. One of them is higher than the other, and yeah, as I said before, that's quite hard to model because many codes assume random polarization, and. Yeah, I've left some references, so if you like, you can stop the video and follow up on this. But there are lots of other ways, uh, solid state and fiber optic devices for uh, measuring the beam really quickly and with high resolution. Uh, but yeah, I, they're more difficult to use for reference dosimetry. They're more for beam profiling, but they can be used for reference dosimetry. But this is not my, my area of expertise. So I'll just leave them there and move along. So the, the main thing uh, Panzer contributed to uh, checking these pinpoint chambers in synchrotron beams was to use a large area uh, calor graphite calorimeter, just shown in the picture. So it's a four centimeter disc of graphite, um, just uses air gaps for insulation. There's no vacuum uh, and some external thermal insulation. And um, funny story, it was actually built by Malcolm McEwen. I'm not sure if he remembers, but uh, he built it when he was at the UK, and somehow it ended up at our Panzer before I started, I think, and was to be used for an electron, as an electron calorimeter. But we've repurposed it for the synchrotron. So thank you, Malcolm. It is a dose area product method in that the beam is 20 millimeters by 20 millimeters, uh, but our active area is a disc four centimeters in diameter which intercepts most of the beam. It misses a bit of the scatter, which you need to correct for. But the equation that gives us the dose in the middle of the beam compared to, um, yeah. So we want the dose on the central axis 
and this is the equation. It's the rate, the rise in temperature, the uh, specific heat of graphite, and the ratio of the area of the core, um, 12.57 square millimeters, to the area of the beam. The area of the beam you have to work out from the beam profile. That is difficult. Uh, this is what we ended up doing. And this was really Jessica Lai's work. But she had a Monte Carlo model and some films. Uh, and the trick is to model, you need to model the profile up here and the dose in the wings, which she did with a hybrid model between basically a film guided Monte Carlo uh, calculation. And you calculate the equivalent area of something that has a, a uniform uh, dose distribution. And that gives you the effective area of the beam. But that's where the uncertainty in this method lies. And I think that's the same with most DAP methods. It's really hard to get the beam accurately, the beam profile. Uh, here they are putting the colorimeter in the beam. You can just see the outside of the insulation, the colorimeters inside the silver box. And this shows the temperature rise when the beam comes on. The, the spike here is actually because the thermistor responds directly to scattered radiation. So um, it goes away at the end. And if you scan in different directions, you convince yourself that um, actually this is not affecting uh, the delta T, which is the, the difference between the slope before and after. But there's a bit different to mega voltage beams where uh, we don't see this such a big spike. It's to do with the, the kilovoltage radiation. <laughs> And finally, um, the other difficult thing is this is a graphite calorimeter and we want dose to water. So we, we get that by modeling the depth dose in graphite, the depth dose in water. And when if they agree, which they do in these two plots, we argue that the Monte Carlo can calculate the ratio between the two. And that's what we used here. And you see the calorimeter and the pinpoint actually agree uh, really well in dose to water. Uh, a shout out that um, this is recent work from Canada where they've uh, put an aluminium calorimeter in a synchrotron beam. This is the, a picture of the outer thing here, but this is a vacuum vessel, not the calorimeter. The calorimeter is actually a, uh, a line shaped like this, a rod. Uh, so I believe you can measure the static field with that. And it's a good illustration that calorimeters, if you're going to use Monte Carlo, uh, the calorimeter can really be any material or any shape. Uh, you have to put some work into checking the, um, that all of the calculations are correct, but it's interesting. And we're proposing to do a comparison between the two methods. Okay, that's the dosimetry part of the talk. Um, I hope it's a little bit, there was a bit, biographical and maybe not as thorough as it could have been, but that's my uh, experience with um, doing dosimetry at synchrotrons. So now I'm going to flip the presentation around and uh, talk about what, what these radiation beams can tell us about our typical radiotherapy directors, uh, detectors, directors. Uh, so, um, I'll talk about imaging, but also investigating things like the spatial response, extracameral signal, and um, polarization effects. So first up, the beamline, uh, this is the IMBL beamline when it's being used for imaging at 100 meters from the source. And every day when I worked there, there was a new sample going in and something new and interesting being image, imaged. This is uh, Daniel Hausman, the, um, principal beamline scientist, I think, or the uh, the guy in charge anyway, um, with a rhinoceros head, I think, that they were CT scanning. Um, over here is Chris Hall and Micah Barnes with a frozen shark's head, also scanning to look at the way the teeth develop in sharks. And uh, this was a Australian bird that I imaged, which it, it was, it illustrates the, um, well, all the detail you can get from a CT, but all, you can also reconstruct it with incredible detail and see the feathers on this bird, which is what's being shown here. Um, so it's a really flexible beamline where you can 
uh, image all these different things. And so we used it to image common radiotherapy detectors. This is the PTW microdiamond. Uh, and because it's monochromatic, you can choose the energy. So you can use a low energy and you'll see um, the, the soft material. So if you want to see through the metal, you use a higher energy. So 80 kV and you can see the support structures and cables. And uh, this detector will come up a bit. So I'm just going to point out that this rectangle up here is a substrate and the actual detector part is a thin film, four microns, that you can't see on top of that where my mouse is hovering. Um, but yeah, just imaging those detectors uh, is valuable. And this shows the projections as we rotate that. It was actually doing a CT, but just looking at the projections is interesting. Uh, you can get a much better picture of what's inside that detector if you look at it from lots of angles. Ah, there we go. So this uh, is the reconstruction in 3D. So I've stripped away the outside of the detector. Um, I've turned up the contrast here to try and see if we can see the electrical connections to the actual um, part of this detector that is active. And you can hopefully you can see it. <laughs> but there are, in fact, two small um, cables. Okay, so you can see two cables coming out and going to one side of the film, and there's two more coming from this post going to the edge of the, the chip. <clears throat> so it is, a, yeah, it's capable of high resolution and high contrast, and you can see really tiny things. What you can also do with that theme is use, so what's happening in this plot is that that detector is being rotated in the x-ray beam and we're taking an image with an x-ray detector at each angle. At the same time we're measuring the signal coming out of the detector. So the graph on the bottom shows the signal from the micro diamond as a function of angle. And there's a couple of interesting things about this. One, one is it changes by quite a lot as you go around and we don't see that with conventional beams. Um, you do see some angular dependence in Linux and KV X-rays, but nothing like uh, the 10 or 20% drop that we see here. The other thing is when it hits this big drop, uh, you'll notice that the substrate flashes. So I'm thinking that this is a Bragg angle. Uh, these are monochromatic X-rays. They hit the Bragg angle, suddenly they are absorbed or not getting through to the detector, and somehow that changes the response. Uh, but this is unpublished because I don't actually have a good um, explanation. I'm just trying to motivate people to uh, use synchrotrons because they're interesting. On the next slide. Hmm. Yeah, this is a, another scan um, with... So this time the detectors side on to the beam. So the beam's going this way, detector side on, and we're just changing the uh, one of the tilts of the detector. And you can see as it goes through, so that the beam is going uh, through the substrate, there's a drop in the response, as well as quite a sharp um, spike when it goes through that angle. Again, you don't see that on conventional beams, but you do see some angular dependence. And finally, um, the other work I did with uh, synchrotrons is to collimate the beam. So this was a radiotherapy beam, not the monochromatic imaging beam. But we could collimate it with a small aperture, say 0.1 millimeters. Uh, because of the high Kerma rate in the beam, you can still put a detector in this beam and get a signal from it. So if you put a pharma chamber here, you can measure the signal coming out even though only one tiny 0.1 millimeter blob of that detector is being irradiated. Then if you move that detector around, you can build up a map 
showing uh, where that detector is responding to the radiation. And that's what we, well, these are alignment scans in the hutch. Um, so perfectly what we do is we put a bit of film on to make sure we're hitting the detector, but you can see the detector has been moved in this sort of pattern uh, so that uh, we're covering the whole detector. It's just the grid's pretty coarse because we're just doing alignment. But if we do a scan with hundreds of lines, we'll be able to build up a picture of the response of that chamber. That's the beam size there. And that was this is another alignment scan for a micro diamond. And so this is for a, a farmer chamber. Here's a photograph. Uh, it's two and a half centimeters long to give you a scale. A radiograph of what's inside it. And then here's the response map uh, to kilovoltage synchrotron radiation. And straight away, it tells you a couple of things like the central electrode responds more than the air and the graphite. Uh, and the region we were more interested in was down here where there seems to be a region where there is no charge collected, probably because the electric field is uh, between the central electrode and the wall is small down here. And there is some uh, response uh, where you get photons grazing the um, the bottom plate there. This uh, should point out, this is for kilovoltage radiation. If you put, these detectors are often used in megavoltage radiation where they're really electron detectors. The photons just go straight through, sorry. Photons go straight through, um, but at kilovoltage, uh, it's detecting photons essentially. Uh, so it's, it's a bit different and it may not be uh, what you would see when you're using this on a LINAC, for example. However, things like the dead zone down here, I think we can still investigate that. And things like the role of the central electrode in kilovoltage dosimetry is clearly illustrated. This is a zoomed up, um, colorized uh, version of that, uh, showing the dead zone down near the base of the chamber. This scan took some three hours, actually, so we don't have too many like this. This is the micro diamond, uh, again, false color, but you can clearly see uh, here we've scanned at end on, and you can clearly see the region that the active region is this red circle. So it, it confirms the manufacturer's specification that it's 2.2 millimeters in diameter. Um, the other thing of interest is that you can see other parts of the chamber do respond. They have a small response. Um, this is a log plot. So it is quite small. But the signal is not just coming from the uh, active volume. Uh, side on, and you can see that region light up like a Christmas tree. And you can also see some radiation coming from the other structures in the microdiamond. <clears throat> So finally, okay, okay. So we also were particularly interested in um, extra camel response in general. So whenever radiation, uh, where does the signal in the detector um, actually come from? For example, we know for a pharma chamber that most of the signal comes from the active volume, but there there is a little bit coming from the stem, if the radiation's on the stem. So whatever is not coming from the active volume, it's the extra cameral signal. And measuring that's quite hard. Uh, ideally, I guess you could you build a vacuum chamber and remove the air, but even then you would probably still pick up charge from particles hitting the, the other components. Anyway, it's not clear. What we did here was, uh, we put the beam, this purple uh, beam, we scanned it across the chamber, and this is the signal plotted below. And the plan was to uh, reverse the polarity and then subtract the two signals and get whatever's left must be the bit that didn't come from the, the thimble, but that didn't work out. Um, this is what, uh, so this is the sense of the scan. So a one millimeter wide beam being scanned across, and these are the currents recorded. I should say we turned the volt the bias voltage down to two volts. Otherwise, um, 
everything was swamped by scatter from the stem being picked up in the thimble. But clearly you can see there is a point here in the scan where the signals are in the same direction. So clearly that's got something to do with charge being deposited directly into the electrical connections of the, the chamber. And I wonder if that can contribute to the uh, bias, the polarity effect. But again, it, it, the other effect that we weren't expecting was that um, plus two volts was quite different to minus two volts. So we couldn't subtract the two. And again, that isn't that result is not yet fully explained. But I'm, I'll leave it there. So in summary, uh, synchrotrons can do lots of things for radiotherapy. Uh, response mapping, uh, imaging with high precision and different energies, uh, 3D imaging, which can show you uh, really fine structure and detail, and concurrent imaging and response maps. So with that, I've I started a list of all the people that I've um, had the pleasure of working with or learned something from, and it got longer and longer and longer, and I really hope I haven't uh, forgotten someone really important, but... Uh, these are all the people. And this is just radiotherapy. I'm not really even including uh, monochromatic beams or breast CT or, or other applications of synchrotron radiation. So um, thank you. <laughs>